Good morning and welcome to this devotional time organised by Tabernacle Baptist Church Newbridge. Good to be with you again. Last time we finished a short series on are you following, are you reading, are you praying? It's to do with my reading recently that we take up a theme today and uh, three themes, common grace, saving grace, and sustaining grace. But I'd like to read some verses from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter, uh, the second letter of Paul to Corinthians, chapter 12. I take up the reading at verse 8. The, the early part of that chapter is uh, Paul's writing about a wonderful experience of an intimacy with God where he, he talks about being caught up in the third heaven. He was in ecstasy with, with God. Wonderful experience. And yet, in verse 8, he, he writes, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. He, he talked about a thorn in the flesh. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. But he said to me, the Lord said to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Jesus said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. A number of things that lockdown has done and and for me and perhaps for many of you on the screen retirement has given us more opportunities to relax and reflect we've been forced to pause the busyness which has been our life's pattern and recently my reading and thinking has led me to consider again some of the fundamental issues of faith. And I, I, I believe in God. Atheism and secular, secularism and humanism have got a real foothold into life, whether national or local. But I believe in God makes sense to me of the universe and the world in which we live. And more than that, the truth is, I believe, that God made you and me. And he has a plan for our lives. God made us to know a relationship with him. That relationship cannot be forced upon us. It must be a free act of will on our part to respond to his loving purposes. The early part of Genesis shows how mankind chooses our own self-designed plan, which led to the fall. Now, there's one song in particular that uh, Reverend Martin Hulbert, who was one time minister in Tabernacle Newbridge, also my pastor in Bethesda for over 24 years. One song in funerals that he refused to have sung or played. And that was Frank Sinatra's song, I Did It My Way. And I believe, and, and I agree with him, that song is a reflection of the Bible story of the fall, the way man chooses to go his own way. It's not a song about honouring our selfish ambitions, but a reflection of self-harm, of abandoning God's loving purposes. Since God is God and made us for relationship with him, how does that work itself out? Common grace, saving grace, 
sustaining grace. I, I received a, a pamphlet through the post from the Christian Institute uh, a couple of days ago entitled Common Grace, and that started my, my thinking. We use the word grace in a number of ways. We could speak of someone moving gracefully or with grace, a dancer or performer. We speak of acts of kindness as acts of grace. Some families may still stop before a family meal and say grace. Now in Bethesda, we've got a WhatsApp group for as many of the members who want to join as possible. All sorts of things appear on there. Uh, and uh, this last week, there was a little video of a dog owner filling two bowls of dog food from a major bin. Two dogs were waiting patiently. He put the lid back on the main bin and put the dog bowls a little way from the dogs. Then he asked the dogs to put their paws on the bin, which they did, and then they bowed their heads. And the owner said grace. And it's only after the amen that the dogs were allowed to their food. They said their grace. But common grace, this was what writ was written in the pamphlet about common grace. We live in a fallen world, but God's common grace means the world is not as loveless, ugly, and chaotic as it could be. The Bible teaches that God restrains evil so that God's creation may be preserved, ordered lives can continue, and ultimately that God may be glorified and the gospel preached to all nations. We are abundantly fortunate and blessed, whoever we are, whether we acknowledge God or not. Psalm 145 says, The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Jesus said, God causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Matthew 5. And God is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Luke 6. Barnabas and Paul would later say something similar. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your heart with joy. The beauty, joy and order we all experience is thanks to common grace. In addition to God's compassion goodness and kindness. His common grace includes his patience with us. In 2 Peter 3, 9 we read, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now the message paraphrase, I do understand is a paraphrase, but I find it very helpful on occasions. That verse in the, in the message, He is restraining himself on account of you holding back the end because he doesn't want anyone lost. He gives everyone space and time to change. Common grace ensures that God's image in us is not completely eradicated by the fall. We are not as evil as we could be. Of course, Common grace hasn't changed a person from being against God and his purposes to being a person who acknowledges God and his plan for our lives. Common grace restrains the heart but does not give a new heart. Only saving grace can do that. All that I've said so far can be simply an intellectual exercise. Common grace, we all benefit from God's common grace. But the last phrase makes God's grace very personal, speaking to our hearts and will 
as well as our mind. Saving grace. Grace in the Bible is all about God's unmerited kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. God's undeserved favour towards us. God's remedy at Christ's expense. Grace is doing for another that which he doesn't deserve, hasn't earned, and couldn't possibly repay. To know God's saving grace in Christ Jesus, we have to admit that because God is God, because he is in his being all goodness, all loving, all holy, all rightness, there is a gulf between God and us, for we are none of those things. All good, all loving, all holy, all right. That relationship with God in Christ Jesus, which gives us completeness, is all of God's grace, his saving grace. Ephesians 2.8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one could boast. Our saving grace is Christ himself. His work on the cross is what saves us, not our parentage, performance, position, prestige. Hebrews 12.12 12 says that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. God's saving grace is completely his gift. To understand how God sees us, if you, if you still use cash, you'll be able to stay with me at this point. Think of a banknote, a £5, a £10, or a £20 note. What makes that note more valuable than any other piece of paper of equal size? It's in the signature. You can crumple the note, step on it, cut it in two and tape it back together, and its worth is still the same because of the signature. The point here is that our value in God's eyes doesn't change or diminish when we get dirty or stepped on or torn apart by life and life circumstances. That's because our true worth is determined not by our own efforts, but by the price Jesus paid for us on the cross. His signature is the cross. And that gives us worth. It's his saving grace. For there is a great gulf between us and God. And that was bridged by Jesus. All our sins from the cradle to the grave were laid on Jesus. And when we accept Jesus as our Saviour and Lord, all his righteousness is transferred to us. We don't have to strive for it. It's a gift. This saving grace is not of us ourselves, not of our own doing. It comes not through our own striving or work. It comes as the gift of God, saving grace. You know, God loves you and me so much that Jesus was given to us. He died on the cross and rose again that we might experience saving grace. Have you received this gift of saving grace? Do you know that your past, with all the stuff that it contains, has been forgiven and your ultimate future is secure in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you those certainties of the saving grace of Christ Jesus? A worship song has these words. Wonderful grace that gives what I don't deserve, pays me what Christ has earned, and then lets me go free. Wonderful grace that gives me the time to change, 
washes away the stains that once covered me. And all that I have, I lay at the feet of the wonderful Saviour who loves me. Saving grace. Common grace. Saving grace. But it's this third title that has intrigued me recently. Sustaining grace. Sustaining grace is actively and continually working in the lives of God's people. The Apostle Paul credited the success of his ministry not to his own substantial labours, but to the grace of God that was with me. We read that in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. The grace of God that was with me. Earlier in that chapter, Paul makes the same point in verse 2. In the NIV, it's translated, By this grace you are saved. But many commentators would suggest, would suggest the better translation would be, In which you are being saved. Sustaining grace is the ongoing benevolent act of God working in us, without which we can do nothing. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul writes about a thorn in his flesh. We read some verses from that chapter at the beginning. Most probably it was a recurring, debilitating illness. For the word thorn could be rendered stake. This illness really struck him hard. And he writes, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he, the Lord Jesus, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Sustaining grace promises promises us not the absence of struggle, but the strengthening power of God's presence through the living power of Jesus in every and all circumstances. In Paul's experience, weakness most probably was the physical pain which reoccurred, although he may have had the mental toll of his life's work or the opposition he endured, even from those who would call themselves Christians, or from misrepresentation or misunderstanding. But Jesus still says, my grace is sufficient for you. I wonder, is there something in your life today which means you are being distracted from what God wants you to do or be in the name of Jesus. Are you fed up with isolation? Is there a physical complaint or illness which takes your attention and is all-consuming? Is there a personal or family issue which dominates your working hours and your sleepless nights? Or our country? at the moment, or the world situation, Jesus says to us, my grace is sufficient for you. It's the sustaining grace which is ready to transform each and every situation. God may not take away the situation or circumstance, but he does promise his sustaining grace in Christ Jesus, in it all and through it all. I told you the story last time about prayer and how powerful prayer can be in the moment, sustaining us. It was in the, the minister's conference and at the end of it, the Baptist Union of Great Britain president prayed 
for us. He wanted us to put our hands up if we wanted prayer. And he prayed for one lady. I didn't put my hand up, but he prayed for me. It was very moving how a person I didn't know had been guided by God's Spirit to pray for me, for my service in the life of the church, for the particular general service over these last seven years. And then to pray for any anxiety I had. And that day I was going to Belindra for a CT scan at half past one. I was looking at the clock, uh, anxious to get there. And all anxiety went. I've started my treatments. I have uh, 20 radiotherapy treatments at the time of recording. I've done four 16 to go. By the time we've recorded this, I'll be well on my way. But I'm totally at peace about it. In the circumstance, in the illness, God's sustaining grace. Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. And I'm very conscious that Christians need to get hold of that idea of sustaining grace. Not merely common grace, which is common to all, whether you're a Christian or not. Saving grace, yes, for the Christian to know that he's been saved by grace for time and for eternity. But sustaining grace today and every day, God is present with his sustaining grace in it and through it all. And we, of all people, ought to be the, the joyous people in this world. The people who have a mission and a charge to share the good news of Jesus with others. To stop our morose walking around as though the whole of the weight of the world is on us. Spending time dotting I's and crossing T's so that our doctrine is pure. We need to know sustaining grace. The sustaining grace which Christ gives. I read this about John Newton. You may remember John Newton, the author of that hymn, Amazing Grace. He was an Anglican clergyman. But before he was an Anglican clergyman, before he was converted to Christ, he was a captain on a slave trade ship. And he wrote this. He found that God's sustaining grace was sufficient for him. He writes, On the day his wife died, he found the strength to preach a Sunday sermon. The next day he visited church members and later officiated at his wife's funeral. Looking back, he wrote, The Bank of England is too poor to compensate for such a loss as mine. But the Lord, all sufficient, speaks, and it is done. Let those who know him and trust him be of good courage. He can give them strength according to their day. He can increase their strength as their trials increase. And what he can do, he has promised he will do. Now, the first verse of the hymn, Amazing Grace, I believe speaks of saving grace. Do you remember the words, Amazing Grace? How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. But another verse, I believe, emphasises sustaining grace. Through many dangers, toils, and snares we have already come. T'was grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. At a moment in my life when church life was particularly difficult for myself and my family, a lady in the church typed out these words for me. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labours increase. To added affliction he addeth his mercy. 
to multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit, his grace has no measure, his power has no boundary known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Sustaining grace. Do you realise that the gift of this day and all the benefits of it are because of common grace? Have you heard, seen and responded to God's saving grace in Christ Jesus on the cross? Do you know new life in him? And are we living in the transforming experience of God's sustaining grace? Do you know grace sufficient in all of your life, its troubles and its joys? For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. My grace is sufficient for you says Jesus. Common grace, saving grace, sustaining grace. Let's pray. Our Father, we remind ourselves of those words of that song, Wonderful Grace, that gives what I don't deserve pays me what Christ has earned, and then lets me go free. Wonderful grace that gives me the time to change, washes away the stains that once covered me, and all that I have, I lay at the feet of the wonderful Saviour who loves me. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the grace the common grace that gives us this day with all the benefits that we know within it. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus who shows us saving grace by coming to this earth and dying upon the cross and rising again that our sins can be forgiven, that the gulf between us and you can be bridged, and that we can know ultimately that our home is in heaven because of saving grace. But our Father, this morning, we, we thank you too for sustaining grace. We thank you for those words of Jesus to Paul, even in his trouble, even when he wanted that thorn in the flesh removed, you said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. Even in the difficulties of life, you sustain us with sustaining grace. And so, Father, we, we thank you for grace in all its manifestations. Common grace, saving grace, sustaining grace. Now, Father, we, we are very conscious that we are well blessed in this country. We've seen, if we were paying attention to the news, we've seen some pictures over the last couple of days. A mother in Yemen who didn't have transport or money enough to get her malnutritioned son to hospital. A nine-year-old blind boy teaching a class of children 
in a bombed out shell of a school in Yemen. Ah, oh, God, forgive us for grumbling about our condition when we have so much. Our Father, through the agencies of which we are a part, our Father, may something of relief come to those people who have very little in this world. And if we can be a part of that practically in our giving, uh, urge us to allow our wills to be pliable to your promptings, we ask. And our Father, for any who are finding living difficult and are unaware of your saving grace, there may be those uh, that we know within our church family, there may be those within our own family that we are praying for at this moment to come to know Jesus through his saving grace. Our Father, where we can help and encourage people we know to turn to Jesus. Our Father, help us not to be too slow. Help us to take the opportunity of the social media we have to connect with those that we love, that we want them to come to know Jesus. Help us to give the words that would prompt another to look to Jesus. And sustaining grace, our Father, Thank you that you're with us in all circumstances and through all circumstances, and your grace is sufficient for us. For any today for whom life is particularly hard, may they know your sustaining grace, the comfort of your grace, the strength of your grace, the assurance of your grace, the gentle touch of your sustaining grace, we pray. And to us all, our Father, as we seek to be the ones who will lay at your feet all that we are, may we know the wonderful Saviour who loves us by grace and wants us to be the people who would tell others about Jesus. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.